I first wanted to be an artist when I was a young girl, yesterday. And then because I was not accepted, I went into history of art. I did all my history of art degree and then I went to uh, fine arts again because I am a little stubborn. So I did uh, all my fine arts career and life took me to another city and um, there I discovered conservation. It was not my intention to go into conservation, but I tried just because I needed something special to do. My life was a mess in that moment. And uh, I, I decided that was amazing. And, and at the point of my life, I was an artist, an active artist. I, I've learned a lot about history of art. Sorry, something is beeping in my computer and I am very, very sorry about that. Yeah, well, so making the whole thing short, I decided that conservation was my real path. And what was the other question? Uh, so why, you, I am, why am I in, in, in Canada? In Canada well, yes is because of life <laughs> but just because the big crisis, economical crisis in Spain took us to Canada. Okay so uh, when did you decide that the artist interview would be the motto for your PhD and for your life change as a conservator? Well I don't know if I decided or it was something that happened in an organic way because uh, in the 90s, as I told you, I, I, was, I was into history of art and I was an artist. So in the 90s, I was an assistant for a great woman, um, Pilar Parcerizas. She's a, she's a really nice curator from Spain. And I helped her. Well, it was a really great opportunity to learn a lot. She was so, so, so nice. And she, and she taught me everything that she knew. Well, not everything, but a lot of things. And my main, my main job with her was to transcribe interviews that she had done to a group of, of conceptual, conceptual artists. She was at that time um, researching for her PhD that it was based on conceptual artists and I am talking about tapes tapes mm -hmm. like literal tapes yes, I know I'm still on that time <laughs> and I remember transcribing the interviews and I am a very talkative person I'm very very curious so I was like wow that's so cool like learning all about of them and she was doing those interviews from the point of view of a conservator of a con, uh, of a curator more from like an, a historian right but even though it was so interesting so i think that was the first time i came into the real life of, of an artist like how cool is that knowing everything from their own sort of their own words but of course i was not a conservator i didn't think about anything of that in when i went to conservation in 2010 i was doing my master degrees and i learned about inca thanks to a, a nice colleague who introduced me to inca and i felt like something um makes sense in my mind because as an historian artist and conservator that was the best way to understand everything and i really always wanted to ask all the artists or i always imagine being beside i don't know frida kahlo and asking why why do you do that why did you choose that what so when i decided when i had to decide about my um, master topic a master's uh, thesis topic, I was convinced that I was going to do something related to the conceptual artists that I already knew because of my 90s project. 
And Pilar Parcerisas was, uh, was really nice and told me, oh, of course, you can use everything that I have and you can use all the contacts and everything. So she, in the 90s, she already introduced me to this artist this group of artists that they were really interesting as, as conceptual artists in Spain in a period of time that was really complicated. So I did uh, my thesis, uh, my master thesis based on three of them, uh, Angel Ribé, uh, Frances Torres, and um, oh my God, Vicente Miaplana, and I interviewed them. But the intention of the interview was just to ask them about how to how they thought uh, that their performance arts from that period had to be kept, and it was just a tool, right? Something that I don't I don't think now. <laughs> so it was just a tool, and um, the intention of this was to be a chapter or an introduction for my PhD thesis because I wanted to keep doing this. So. After the master thesis, I uh, enrolled to the PhD uh, program in Valencia, in the Polytechnic University of Valencia, with the intention of, uh, of uh, doing the same topic, to extend it to other artists, and not just for the performance art, but related to the all conceptual artists. Mm -hmm. And then life happened, and I moved to Canada just like, six months after enrolling in that program. Okay. And the idea was the interview, but not the focus of the, of the, of the thesis. The interview was still a tool. The thesis was about conceptual artists, this group of conceptual artists. But everything evolved and Time was telling, well, something was telling me that the interview was the real interest. And my, my and this group of artists, they were, they were all so amazing and they were all so open. And maybe because I was introduced to them in the 90s, I had like a little bit, I didn't know them as friends, right? But it was not a cold call, right? Mm -hmm. So I started to work with them. And then, as I said, life happened. And I started to work for an um, art project. It was a marketing art project. So the main goal of the art project was not art, was marketing. Okay. Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> yeah, I have more questions, but uh, you, keep, uh, you can keep starting. I think, I think some of the questions will be related. I don't know if you want, but well, the thing is that because I started to work with this pro, uh, in this project, this was 2013. Um, it was a group of arts that they were not meant to be a collection, but it was a group of arts made by emerging artists, young artists, not all of them were young, but all of them were emerging artists mm -hmm. from all over the world. And those artists had, the, um, uh, well, they had to make something. They had to produce a piece of art based on the experience that they had be, uh, with uh, having the contact with a patient or a family or member related to the patient from some specific disease. Okay. This, this project was, was um, run by a pharmacy company. And that's why they think about uh, disease and everything. So in my mind, I was working with the conceptual artists, I told you, but then as a conservator, I always thought that the interview was important. It was something that we had to use as we do pictures and measurements. So maybe we don't have the time or the resources to do, uh, to to conduct a very long conversation, but at least the main points, right? So when I started this project, I decided by myself in my mind that I will ask all the artists whatever I can. And that's uh, how you decided to work first with, um, 
with young and emergent artists. Yeah, and, because but but you are keep doing it, right? Yes, because uh, I am a very like I don't know emotional person or excited person or I I always like the pro there is always something interesting in everything and if you want to find it you will find it and at that moment I in my mind I was still doing my PhD for the UPB uh, University based on conceptual artists and I was studying and I was trying to as I was in Canada I thought okay maybe I can do something on con Canadian conceptual artists also so I was researching for that but in my day job, those, uh, this group of artists were amazing. And every answer they gave me was so different. So I started to think, why am I doing my PhD based on this group of artists? That they are nice, they are amazing and super interesting. While this group of artists, the, the emerging artists, nobody cares. Not even the owner. So I thought, why don't I change my topic after a long conversation and a lot of questions? <laughs> I decided that it was worth it because I don't know, they were not, they were not there. Nobody cared. Right. And on the other hand, the, their answers were so amazing and so interesting because if you think about it, who asked them? anything who cares so the first the first thing for uh, the first thing was the, the smile in their face every time i ask them uh what do you want to do with your piece are you really asking me so the showing respect and showing them that i care was so amazing the the feedback was really really satisfying and do they care about the preservation of their artworks? Of course they yeah. do. Not in the way that we think conservation, preservation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you think about an emerging artist or any emerging professional, you are full of passion. Everything that you are doing is amazing and it's yours. So when you are selling something, as an artist, and I remember when I was a young artist starting, the first thing I saw, it was like, oh, it's my daughter. I'm giving away something so personal. So you care what that person is going to do. If it, that person comes and asks you, oh, what do you want me to do with this piece? Do you want me to clean it? Do you want me to preserve it? Do you? So you are like, oh, those are the best parents for my piece, right? So. Yeah. It was so gratifying because I am not saying that um, already established artists are not grateful, but they are more used to that kind of questions. Yeah. They and are the, used to the respect. And the, do you give them uh, any advice on the preservation of their artwork or only if they ask, so you don't interfere with their creativity? Yeah. Okay. The truth is I used to do it because I cannot stay quiet or silent. <laughs> it's, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but I have learned that's not a thing that we have to do. Okay. <laughs> uh, for my PhD research and for that job that I was doing, I did uh, more than 100 um, interviews, but there were 83 like official but in the whole collection there were more than 387 artists so i i learned my first interviews were like a disaster a real disaster and now i am showing them in my in my database because i think it's important for everybody to know that this is not correct you okay. don't have to do this because if we show just the fine and nice and bright nobody's gonna learn and well going back to the question <laughs> yes i used to give them advice and i i've learned that that's not a good thing but also depends on depends on the relationship you have with the artist depends mm -hmm. on what kind of 
situation is going there because sometimes you feel like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not what you want to do because you are telling me this and I already know that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sometimes you feel like you have to. Sometimes you have to find or, okay, I'm not saying anything that you have to take as a, the truth. It's my experience and I am no one to say what you have to do. So just take it as uh, my advice. But no, it's not good to give advice and it's not good to interfere because one of the things I found, some of my, I am going to call them my artists, but some of the, <laughs> yeah, uh, the emerging artists with, uh, I worked with, they had a real crisis. They stop it. And then I, I freak out. It was like, oh my God, I am, I am like creating a big problem here because now they don't want to produce. And now I am interfering in the creative process. Mm -hmm. So I felt so, so bad. But at the same time, I, I learned not to give advice to some people who were not ready for it or didn't want it. Mm -hmm. But I told them, think about those materials. Maybe you want to research. Maybe you want to try. Maybe not telling them what is going to happen. But I think if you know that something wrong is going to happen and this wrong, it's not in their intention, I think we have to say something. But you have to find a way. You have, it's like a doctor, right? If you go to the doctor and the first thing they ask you is, are you a smoker? He's not going to laugh and say, okay, keep doing it, right? But maybe you have to find a way to say it with love words. <laughs> love very, words. And very good, very good. So how do, you, how do artists react when you approach them and uh, explain uh, what, to, what you want? And how do you select the artists, the artists for the interviews? Well, when I was working in that project, that was something that I decided because I wanted the information for my own job. Uh, I thought that it was important to have this information to proceed. I had some situations there because it, as I said, it was not a collection. It was a group of art, uh, of pieces that were traveling and they traveled a lot. So a lot of people was touching them and they were not art specialists. They were professional of other kinds of fields and accidents happen. So I had a lot of emergency situations that I had to deal with and I wanted to know what they wanted. So I, when I approached them for that, it was me approaching them. And uh, the first thing that it's why wow, you want that information, surprise. It's, there is always a big surprise in their face and The first, the first thing is surprise. The second thing is thank you. Always. Okay. I don't recall having a bad experience. Okay. I have a lot of situation, weird situations, but that's of course. That you And have you ever the instead of, uh, of contacting you, the artist? Have you had the, the opposite, an artist con contacting you? No, but not always goes in the way like, hi, can I interview you? No, um, now it's very different. When I was doing the PhD, it was something that I, I had like scheduled and it was, it was a research, right? Mm -hmm. It was my job, but at the, same one was a uh, at the same time was a research. So there were some kind of procedures or procedures that I wanted and I had to do. Now it's different. Now sometimes it's that I go to, um, I don't know, an exhibition and when you are, as conservators, we have like mind that you are looking at something and you're thinking, oh my God, that, what, mm, how should, no, right? You make a lot of questions in your mind, right? So, uh, and the, the first, one of the most important things I've learned when I was doing my research 
was not to assume anything. No, don't assume. Because we tend to assume, right? Mm -hmm. As humans. But mm -hmm. as conservators, everything has to be clean. Everything has to be well. Everything has to look nice or perfect, right? And that's not a problem. It's how our mind is wired, right? And I had a situation with an um, uh, installation piece that there were a group of hands made of plaster and they were all broken. And the owner wanted me to fix it, fix it. And the thing was that when I saw the piece, we didn't have any, any documentation about the piece, any statement, anything. But I, the only thing I knew, it was based on a disease that was very painful. So as my artist mind, I thought, well, those cracks can be about pain. And if I fix it, I am bro uh, breaking the piece. I am destroying the piece. But if it's not because of that, I am maintaining the piece, destroy it, <laughs> right? So you didn't know if the, the, it was intentional? Nothing? No, no, no. It, it's very, 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 very different. What you learn in the university that they teach you how to work in a very nice museum with a lot of prefer, uh, professionals around you, helping you to do everything and all the documentation is in your hand, than the reality. You have no documentation, nothing. There is no documentation, nobody knows anything, not even how to exhibit it. Yeah. So sometimes it's, it's about goodwilling. <laughs> you want to, and everybody, I, I, don't re, I don't remember anyone being unprofessional, but if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know, you don't care. That's my motto. If you don't yeah. know, you don't care. So with that particular situation, well, it ended not doing anything because I couldn't talk to the artist and never knew if that was like intentionally or an accident. But as, oh, well, I went to the, too far for us answering your question, but yes, then I approached my artist. Now it's, it's something more organic. I know the artist, I asked them some questions and then they started to think about things that they never thought. And then they asked me, why do you do that? And so sometimes it's because I ask them, do you want me to do it like a real good interview or you don't? Most of the, most of the times they like the idea because what I learned is that the artists feel respect and feel everybody likes to talk about their work yeah. and everybody likes to be listened. And at the end of everything, and, and it's just a human interaction. Yes. So, and what about the platforms of dissemination of interviews? Uh, because we have uh, like uh, sites like Voca, Inca, ADP, yours, like Testimony Art. Um, but should it be an international platform to join all the interviews uh, already made worldwide? Uh, this doesn't exist, right? Well, as far as I know, no. And it, would it be an important tool, someone to organize, uh, or it's impossible to do it? Mm, I think it's impossible. And I don't think I, I like it. That's why. Well, that's personal information, right? If you want to look at us, they are humans, right? It's an artist is a person. And at the end of everything, this is information. So at least if you want something, maybe you want to look for it. So search for it. <laughs> but well, I don't say it's not good to have good platforms. I don't say it's not good to mm, have them interact i personally think that if you don't share it doesn't exist and that's why i try to share everything and knowledge is nothing if you don't share it it's important to share it doesn't matter if you are big or, or small share it 
there is no important thing or no not important it's important to share so yes i think it it has to be it has to be outside and everybody has to be able to to find it but i don't think it would be a good idea to have one only place who decides what's going there or who on it's not going there in my utopic idea, uh, all should be there. It's just a, a, an easier way to find uh, all the interviews. I don't so know. If, if it's kind of crazy if you think that uh, every day we are doing interviews, right? It will be like a super big database. Yeah. And in the, on the other hand, not all the interviews are about conservation. We are interested in all kinds of interviews. I do. I am interested in all kinds of interviews. And sometimes you are listening to an interview that it's not related to conservation, but you are learning a lot because you are learning about the artist's intent or what was he thinking or right? Yeah. But how are you going to manage that? I don't know. I don't see it. But I do think that it's good to have uh, a, a space with resources in all the platforms where you have the possibility to go to other resources, right? Mm -hmm. okay. In my own website, I have a, a resources area where I connect the resources of others. Yeah, if you I go saw. to Boca's page, you will see that you can go to other platforms and well, the big platforms like Boca or Inca, they have a lot of resources where you can go but there is there are so many projects that you we don't even know mm -hmm. okay no that's that's my question uh, i can assume that uh, someone that is uh, working on artist interview would like to see if uh, uh, and someone has done an interview to one artist should it should that person do, do another interview to the same artist or of course should... yes <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I have interviewed some artists more than once. Yeah, that's one question that I have for you. <laughs> oh, okay, so go ahead. Okay, so uh, because I, I saw you have interviewed uh, Coco Guzman twice. Yes. And um, why, first, and uh, second, uh, her perspective on preservation has changed since the first interview, or it was not uh, even a, a question? Yes. So I interviewed they like um, first it was because I met Coco in a congress and we were the two of us Spanish. Okay. That was the only reason we connected. <laughs> then when I learned about their work, I was like, oh, I don't know anything about um, ge neutral gender artworks. I don't know anything about um, whatever what she was do, what they was doing, and I learned so much. So I asked, "Do you want to do an interview with me?" And at the moment, they were producing the must uh, the master this is uh, show, and we decided to do it just as an experiment. Why we did two? Because the first one we didn't record it. <laughs> Just, it was a technical reason, right? Okay. But in between the first one that we recorded in audio, but not what we wanted, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I say we, because this is a two phases work. It's not just you go, you are the conservator, you lead everything, no. You are there and they are the important part. So uh, we decided that we will do a second one. In between, it happened that uh, they went to uh, the uh, Havana Viennal and they had the opportunity to install a piece that changes depending on the space. And because the conversation we had before, Coco had the opportunity to decide some things different based on cons on conservation so the second interview was very different not in the 
main things because the main things were the same. But how Coco approached the interview and how the interview affected the work they were doing? Yes. So okay. yes, I've done several times some artists and it's really different. That's why I think everybody has to do an interview. Because if I am interviewing Coco and Anfi, hi Anfi, it's interviewing Coco, she will do a different interview. Okay. Not just because Anfi is different, because the same artist is different. In different moments. Yeah different moment. And do you think you have a role uh, in uh, educating artists for preservation? Do you try yes. that in the interview? This is a big yes. In fact, when I present myself, I don't say I am an art conservator. I say I am an, an, a, a race, a awareness racer. Because I think, and again, I, myself it's my opinion it's not the truth i think that the conservation we do when you, we are conducting interviews it's it's a two ways information and even if you don't give any advice they are becoming aware because the questions you are, you do you ask yeah. make them think and now for example i am i am I am working in a project of portfolio reviewing. Emerging artists that are presenting their portfolio and I am part of the group of professionals reviewing the portfolio. Of course, I am not telling anything about aesthetics or things like that, but I make uh, questions about things like, oh, is it the screen television that you are going to put in the show important for you? has to be this one or has to be, have you thought that this one maybe will become obsolete? And these kind of questions make them make decisions. But these kind of um, talks are important, not just for artists, curators, conservators, mm -hmm. any kind of professionals. Because being aware, as I was saying at the beginning, you don't care about something you don't know. And that's the main thing. If you don't know it, you cannot be worried about it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I think, yes, it's very important education. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you edit the artist's transcript? And if yes, can you discuss your approach? Yes, I do. I do because, as you have noticed, I talk too much. And sometimes in the interview, there are parts that are not important for the main goal. Sometimes it's because something happened in the middle. Sometimes uh, it's more because of human situations than anything. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's very difficult to decide what do you keep and what you don't. That was one of the biggest thing I had when I had to do my research. And this was one, one aha moment when I went to the workshop, um, and then a uh, workshop done uh, by Boca about artist interviews. They talked about that, about how to proceed, how you manage the information you have. And there, of course, everyone think different, right? Do you have to keep those silence? Yes, silence are, very, very important. Sometimes the artist is just thinking. Sometimes not saying anything is telling you everything and how you are going to transcribe that in a paper. Now, I don't, I don't have my interviews in a, in a voice recording archive in my database because those are uh, interviews that I am uploading now. They were from the research and a lot of things cannot be there mm -hmm. because of the natu nature of the project. But yes, I edit it, and I don't have the I don't have the formula. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so not a problem. Yeah, we have a, an answer here in the chat for you. Uh, is the interview has the interview a, leg, a legal value? Well, I think they it has, but I cannot say yes. I wrote uh, 
a big yes because i am not legal expert okay and but it depends on the countries no yeah it depends the on laws. the countries it depends on the situation it depends on everything but i think the the word of the artist is the first thing right mm -hmm. yeah of course and uh, one last question because we are running out of time uh, do the artists care if their work, artwork has been or will be restored? Well, that depends on the artist. There are all kinds of artists, all kinds of answers. There is no one answer. No. I'm sorry because those are... No problem. Really... <laughs> really uh, I don't have a formula for that, no. Of course, that's, uh, that's uh, the, the truth. So it's uh, not a problem. All the artists are different and all, of course, for each artwork, they will be, they will have a different uh, solution, I think. So, yes. Thank you very much, Ruth. We are really in the end of the talk. So can you turn on all your cameras so we can say goodbye to each other? Uh, thank you very much for the ones that are with us since our first chat. This is already the eighth. Next week, we will have two talks, one in uh, Spanish again on Tuesday with Maria Quinta from Agar Agar, a Spanish company, and uh, one on Friday with Kathleen Southwick from Sustainability and Conservation. So if you want uh, more information, we will send you next week. Till then, take care. Thank you very much, Ruth. It was a really pleasure to meet you. Thank and, uh, you. Thank, thank you, you all thank you. for being with us. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.